Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for worship today. I want to invite you right here at the beginning to hang in there for the whole message. I know some of you aren't used to that, uh, but it'd be really great if you did, because today we're going to be talking about eternal life, or why I believe in life after death. I also realize many of you don't like talking about death. Um, how many of you, would, in fact, would, let me see a show of hands. How many of you would actually say that you live in fear of dying? Uh, many people do, and there's many different ways of dying. How many of you would admit that you've been afraid of sharks ever since Jaws came out in the mid-1970s? And because of that, you refuse to go into the ocean. All your friends are in there swimming, but you're like, nope, not going to do it because Jaws is going to come by and he's going to eat me and I don't want to die this way. But uh, some years ago, Lifestyle Magazine actually listed uh, the top 25 ways that you are more likely to die than by shark attack. It included some simple things like everyday things that we do, like cars and planes, and that makes a lot of sense that, you know, cars and planes, but we all do it every day, and we don't even think twice about it. But the reality is you're far more likely to die in a plane crash or a car crash or something like that. How about this one? Hippos. Yeah, everybody thinks they're just, you know, cute little cuddly kind of animals. That's not so. More people die by hippos than sharks every single year. Then there's some really interesting ones, kind of like vending machines. And I don't know, maybe this is kind of like the Darwin Awards or something where uh, somebody gets their head stuck in a vending machine trying to get their Doritos or a, a free Snickers bar. But you are more likely to die by a vending machine. Some of you didn't know that you're taking your own life in your very hands to try to go after that bag of Doritos or that Snickers bar or that can of soda that's coming out of that vending machine. Or how about this one? I found this one to be interesting. You are more likely to die by a champagne cork than you are to be eaten by a shark or even something as simple as just getting out of bed. Many more people die every year falling out of bed than they will ever do by getting eaten by a shark. Now, uh, this is a little bit silly, and I get that, and, but I want you to see that we have some irrational fears, uh, but the fact is, a lot of us live in fear of death or dying, which is really interesting to me, because so far, the surveys are out, it's one-to-one, -one, a ratio of one-to-one. -one. Everybody that's born also dies. And so it's something I think it's really important for us to talk about. And I hope that if you'll hang all the way through the end of this, then you don't have to be afraid of dying. So everybody dies. The question is simply a matter of when or how, or more importantly, is where? Where will you be? Everybody dies, but you need to hear this. Some of you are non-believers and I appreciate you uh, tuning in and you're, you're looking for comfort. You're looking for peace. You're looking for hope and you're looking for a, a deeper meaning to life. And I'm glad you did that. Um, but many people are going to die, but everybody has eternal life. It's not simply like you just think, well, I don't like God and I don't like heaven and I don't like Jesus and I don't believe in any of that. And when we die, we just go into nothing. In fact, that is not true. The fact is everybody goes somewhere. You're going to be one of two places. You're going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. So the more important question is not if or when or even how. The question is, where are you going to be? And I pray that if you hang in there uh, for today, then you'll find some encouragement, some strength, and some hope, and even excitement about life after death. Now, unfortunately, too many people have some misunderstandings about the afterlife, and many times we get our theology from the wrong places. There's a cute country song that's out right now by Kenny Chesney, and it, and it says, everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. And I think even a lot of Christians feel that way, is that, yeah, we like the idea that Jesus is our fail-safe, heaven is our fail-safe, there's someplace safe where we can go when we die, and when we die, that's where we want to go. But we cling to this life for as long as we possibly can. 
But if you actually get it right, the theology right, and you understand it, it's actually better for us to die. To be away from the body is to be with the Lord, and that's where we will find true and total fulfillment. Let's just suffice it to say, there's a lot of places you can get your theology. You can get it on, on Twitter and Facebook and, and the internet and all these different places. You can find it in songs, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of bad theology out there. One of them is this country song, and I actually don't even have the time to go into how many things are incorrect theologically about the song. Cute song, catchy little tune, but it really isn't helpful for us to understanding heaven. And um, some of you may remember, I, I actually uh, remember watching as a young boy a cartoon that was written to help kids like me feel better about dying and going to heaven. It's called the littlest angel. But even in that, uh, the theology is really not good. Let's suffice it to say that the best place you can get your theology and understanding about the afterlife is not in a country music song and it's not in a kid's cartoon. It's right here in scripture where Jesus gave us the hope of eternal life in heaven with him forevermore. Well, one of the things that's made clear in scripture is that before the resurrection, so if you have admitted in your own heart, uh, by the way, God already knows what you're thinking, so you might as well go ahead and admit it. Confession means to agree with. You're just agreeing with God. I have this fear surrounding death and dying. We all know somewhere in the back of our minds that we're going to die. But I want you to hear this, that before the death and resurrection of Jesus, Every one of the disciples was afraid to die. If they weren't afraid to die, then they would have been there at the foot of the cross with Jesus, with his mother, and we do have to give props to John because he was there with Jesus' mother. But every one of them before the cross was afraid to die. But after his death and resurrection, not one was afraid to die. In fact, they all went on to preach the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world, regardless of what anybody said. They were beaten, they were imprisoned, and, and they were crucified, they were, they were hung. They, they, all of them died a martyr's death, all of them except for one. And that's where we get our scripture lesson today. And it comes from John, the disciple. And John is imprisoned. He's lived to be an old man. But he's in prison on the Isle of Patmos because he's preaching the good news about Jesus Christ. Now, I confess to you that Revelation can sometimes be a very confusing book. When I was in seminary, I was struggling a little bit with really understanding some of the symbolism, the, the dreams and the visions and the symbolism that's found. It's called apocalyptic literature. And uh, many times it's confusing. I know there's a lot of preachers and there's a lot of teachers and they think they know exactly what it means. I don't think anybody really does. What they do have is some educated guesses. That's why there's many different ideas about what the true meaning of the symbolism is. One day, I think it will all be clear to us. But what is not confusing about the book of Revelation is the point. The meaning is not lost. And at the end of the day, here's what it says. God wins. God wins. God wins. If you want to have peace forevermore, if you want to be with God forevermore, then you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. He's the only way. There's one name by which we can be saved, and that by Jesus Christ. But the book of Revelation tells us about the end times, and it tells us about our end times, and even gives us a picture of what heaven is like. Let's take a look at our, our scripture lesson for today. It is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And John writes this. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. In case you were planning on hanging around here forever, you need to hear this life, this earth, this way of living is going to be destroyed. It is temporary. We're not meant to live here forever, but we are eternal and we will live somewhere forever. He says, so I saw a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. By the way, if there's no sea, maybe there's no sharks in heaven, but if they are, they won't bite. How about that? So verse two, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men. See, temporarily we are set apart and we are set apart from God. But in that day, the apostle Paul that says we see dimly as in a mirror, we see shadows, we see evidences, but then one day we will know even as we are known. We feel this ache in our heart because we are separated from God. But one day we will be reunited with him. And it says, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. There's not going to be any guesswork anymore. They will be his people and God himself. And I pray this is good news for you. God himself will be with them and be their God. And listen to this because here's the encouraging news that we want to hear from this. He will wipe away every tear. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have cried before? How many of you have been broken hearted? How many of you have just been, been cut to the heart and, and you're just so sad by some of the things that are happening in this world? And he said, one day he will wipe away, not just some, not just a few, but every tear. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Many of us cry at the the loss of a loved one, at their death. He said there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink. Pay attention to this, because we're going to come back to this in a little bit later. It says, to him who is thirsty, I will give him to drink without cost. From the spring of the water of life. And he who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, now here's the the but, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murders, the sexually immoral, and those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And if you had stood for that, then you may be seated. All right. So I promised you that at the beginning, I would make it clear why I believe in the afterlife. And I'm going to make this just as simple as I possibly can. And the answer is why I believe in the afterlife is because Jesus said so. That's it. See, once you set your heart and mind that Jesus is the Christ... Now, G.H. did a, uh, Pastor G.H., Reverend G.H. Trumbo, he did a great job last week providing a foundation because everything about our faith has to do with the cross and the resurrection from the dead. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, then nothing matters. You and I, our faith doesn't matter. The world doesn't matter. What we do doesn't matter. If Jesus did not raise from the cross, raise from the dead, then nothing matters. But listen to this. If he did raise from the dead, he is the only thing that matters. I've confessed to those of you who've been with me for some time at at Spring Life Church here that there's many times when I was growing up, I was always a believer, but I had faith doubts. I had struggles and and some of the scriptures seemed a little bit too far-fetched for me to really buy into or believe. But when I settled my heart on the resurrected Jesus, then everything else fell into place and I didn't have to explain everything else. And in fact, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. That's what I really need to know. The rest of it 
as Paul Harvey probably is already hearing and maybe he knows, is, is the rest of it is going to come later. And we will get it and we will understand whether there was really a Noah, whether there was really a flood, whether uh, where Jonah was really in the belly of a well. You know what? I don't have to solve that anymore because I put my faith and trust not in Jonah, not in Noah, not in a well, but in Jesus Christ, the resurrected son of our heavenly father. So that's why I believe in life after death is simply because of the resurrection of of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. So, let's talk a little bit what heaven is like because I, I sense that some of you are still afraid to die, all right? So, let's talk about what heaven really is like. Uh, many people have many ideas about heaven. Many people have gotten their theology from cartoons and songs and books and everywhere else except for the scripture. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, there's, the average Christian still believes that we will become angels. In fact, in Kenny's song, he talks about everybody wants to get their wings and fly around. I have to admit, I want to be able to fly. I think that's a dream of mine. Many of you know I ride a motorcycle because it's the closest thing I think I'm ever going to get to actually flying. But the truth of the matter is we don't become angels. Let me make this clear. Angels are angels and humans are are humans, and you will always be a human. When that littlest angel came out, I remember being a young boy and, and sitting with my family and watching this and, and worrying about that halo staying on place and, and worrying about earning the wings. The reality is we don't get wings. Now, some other people... And, and please don't, don't tune me out because of this one either. Uh, because this one actually comes from scripture. But it comes from the King James Version. And so we're going to blame King James for this interpretation. But there are many people, and I've heard from some of you who say, I still like the King James Version of John chapter 14 a little bit better than I do the NIV. Because in the King James Version, we are promised mansions. Who doesn't want to live in a mansion? Who, who is struggling with life here, struggling with provision here, struggling with all kinds of things here? And we think about when we go to heaven, we're going to have this huge mansion that's on a hill. We're going to have beautiful vistas. We're going to have servants and everybody's going to take care of everything. That's not true. In the NIV, they actually, the interpreters kind of toned it down a little bit more. But what you need to hear is, no, I don't think you're going to get a mansion but every one of you needs to hear that there's a room. There's a special place for you and for me and for everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There are no homeless in heaven. There are no outcasts in heaven. In fact, Jesus was all about bringing people into the faith. And when we're with him, there's going to be plenty of room for you and for me. Now, what does scripture say about heaven? Well, we read a little bit of it here in our passage here, but John describes heaven as having streets of gold. If you've ever wondered about that, um, it, it, it's the most valuable thing that we have. And yet the old joke goes on that pavement, there's a guy who jokingly brought gold to heaven and and St. Peter says to him, pavement? Why did you bring pavement? Because it's so precious, important for us here. But it really, we have no needs in heaven. So much so that they use gold as pavement. Now we all agree, it is shiny and it is beautiful. And so John says, the streets of heaven are paved with gold. That the gates into heaven are pearl. And that the walls are like gemstones. Here, he's got a vision and he's trying to describe for all of us how beautiful heaven really is. Now, <laughs> uh, there's a story of Billy Graham who was a guest on Johnny Carson's show. And if you know Johnny Carson, uh, he loved to golf. And apparently he asked Billy Graham, will there be golf in heaven? Uh, if you golf like I do, you hope not. 
But if there is golf in heaven, then maybe we'll actually be good at it. Somebody made a joke that golf is actually spelled backward, is actually flog, and that's what it more seems to be. But Johnny Carson loved to play golf, and, and so he asked Billy Graham, he said, is there going to be golf in heaven? And I thought Billy gave a really good answer. And he said this, he says, Johnny, if, and we have to underscore, if you get into heaven and you need golf to make you happy, then yes, Johnny, there will be golf in heaven. Now, let's be clear about this. Billy Graham was not saying there would be golf in heaven. He was not saying whether or not Johnny Carson was going to be in heaven. He was simply saying to Johnny, to you, and to me, that everything we need for a fulfilled life is going to be there. No more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more sin, no more fear, no more dying, no more death. None of those things, but light and love and peace and happiness forevermore. All right, so that's a better picture of what heaven is truly going to be like. But we need to know and hear and understand because there's a lot of people out there. And I've heard one pastor say, I truly believe that Satan is behind this. And is trying to teach the people of God that there is no hell. And that is not correct. And that is not in the Bible. The Bible is very clear. Why do I believe in hell? Because the resurrected Jesus said so. The resurrection validates everything else that Jesus said about life and about eternity, about heaven and about hell. He even tells the story of the rich man and the beggar who was not the same Lazarus, but he was named Lazarus as well. I guess it was like John back then or Bill today. A lot of Lazarus. So it's a different one. But he tells the story that the rich man had wonderful things in this life and outside of his gates, there was a beggar there. And you could almost hear him say that every day he went in and out, that beggar was just whining and moaning and complaining. And suddenly he said, don't you want to go give some food? How about throw the beggar some money? He's like, no, in fact, I just wish he wasn't even there. But both men died. One, the beggar, Lazarus, went to heaven. The rich man went to hell. Now, we look to Dante. <laughs> if you've ever thought of hell as being a devil with horns and pitchforks and caves that are full of fiery furnace, we get that, not from scripture, but we get that from Dante. Remember, your theology should not come from the things of the world but from scripture itself. But what Jesus does make clear is there is a hell. You will live in one of two places for all of eternity. You will live in heaven with God where everything's wonderful or you will be tormented in hell. One thing that's clear from Jesus' story is that the rich man, when he went to hell, he was in torment. It, it said he was thirsty. I wanna ask you, have you ever been parched? Have you ever been thirsty? I remember when I was in junior high school, I grew up here in central Florida, and we had to have football practice and full pads, 98 degrees, 100% humidity, and there was no grass because it was all dried and it was dead in the sand. And there were so many days where I thought I would sell my soul just to get a drink of water. Maybe you felt that way before. Maybe you can empathize with this rich man who's now being tormented in hell. And he's saying that he is so parched. He's so dry. He's so thirsty that he asked Father Abraham, and you need to hear this too. You can see who's in heaven and who's in hell because he says that he could see up into heaven. And he asked Father Abraham to go over to that beggar that the rich man had walked by on a daily basis. And ask him to just dip his finger in a cool drink of water so that he might be able to quench his thirst. Now Abraham said something really important and you need to hear this. 
Some pastors, some teachers will teach that there's this intermediary ground where you can have a second chance. Jesus didn't give us a second chance. You got one shot at this. And that's living here in this life to get this right. You have one thing to do is to get to know who created you, who loves you, and who wants to be with you forever. That's our heavenly father. So much so that he sent his one and only son into the world to die on that cross so that we could be washed clean, forgiven of our sins. But some people, unfortunately, aren't paying attention to the scripture, not, not a paying attention to what Jesus is actually saying about it. And he tells the rich man, sorry, bud, because there's a gulf, there's a chasm, there's a barrier between heaven and hell. And those who are in heaven will never be able to get down to those who are in hell. And those who are in hell will never be able to get into heaven. So when we go from this life, we will go one of two destinations. We're either going to be in heaven for all of eternity or we're going to be in hell for all of eternity. Now, the other thing that's really important for us to hear is that our time and opportunity to accept Jesus Christ is right now. It's right here on this earth. Because the rich man became sad for his family. And he begged Abraham to go and to to tell his brothers about eternal life. And Abraham shook his head sadly and he said, you know what? And you need to hear this. This is Jesus telling the story through Father Abraham. And you need to hear this. If you've thought, well, I need something else. I need a miracle. I need a sign. And Jesus makes it clear. You already have everything that you need. Because Abraham tells the rich man. He says, even if someone was raised from the dead, they still would not believe. That's unbelievable to me. How can you know about heaven? How can you know about hell and still choose hell? But some people are waiting to have all the T's crossed and all the I's dotted to have everything before they put their faith and trust. In fact, you need to hear something else about this. What Jesus says is the way is narrow and few will find it. There's actually more going to hell than there are in going to heaven. That makes me sad. But it also tells us why it's so important that we're about the business of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So what does this story tell us about heaven and hell? Why is this important for you and for me? The important thing is that we have every thing we need. It doesn't mean that all your doubts are erased. It doesn't mean you have an answer for everything. It doesn't mean that you could perfectly exegete the book of Revelation. By the way, it's Revelation, not Revelations. It's the revealing of eternity to come, of which we know the answer to that is that God wins, God wins, God wins. But the important thing is that we can make a decision about our future now. A lot of people who don't like the doctrine of hell say, I I, I can't believe that a loving God would send anybody to hell. My friends, I don't believe God would send anybody to hell either. (laughs) But God created hell for all those who did not want to be with him. The other thing that a lot of Christians and a lot of wannabe Christians believe is that they will all go to heaven one day. Jesus was very clear about this. He said, not everybody who calls on me, Lord, Lord, is going to be there. That's that's one of those verses that scares me to death. One of two things he's going to say to us when we stand before him, and my friends, don't don't be confused about this. I, I know it seems like this virus is going on forever and ever, that we're not able to gather together as the people of God. But this world... It's fleeting. It's temporary. It's going away. And the important thing is that we understand the love of our heavenly father. I don't tell you about hell to scare you into heaven. 
I don't think that's a valid way for us to come into heaven. That we would just rather go to heaven than to go to hell. Um, that's Vegas heaven. That, that's hedging your bets about heaven. What you need to hear is about the love of the Father who says there is another way. And I love you so much that I sent my one and only son. And whoever wants to be with me, all they have to do is accept him as their Lord and Savior. And they will be with me. My friends, we don't have to be afraid of life. We don't have to be afraid of sharks. We don't have to be afraid of getting out of bed in the morning. We can toss our head back and we can laugh at death. Because Jesus has conquered the grave. Now, I want to say to some of you who've been watching, and God bless you if you're still here, you're still with me. But maybe there's something, this gravitational pull that you feel. Maybe there's some of you who are watching that feel this yearning, this parchedness, this thirstiness that you want to know about eternal life, that you want to know that this world is not all there is, that there's actually something better coming. And there is something better coming. And that is eternal life with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, um, I confess to you that I have always been a Christian. I have always had some kind of understanding of life, of death, of heaven and hell, even from the time of being a young boy. When I was about four years old, and I won't go into the weird story, but we were given an iguana for Halloween as a pet. Now, this was back in the early 60s. We did not have Google. We did not have internet. We didn't have anybody that had an iguana to know how to ask and to care for it. And so, unfortunately, within a few days or weeks, the iguana died. We went out as a family around the side of the house into the rose bed that was there on the side of the house and, and we took our cute little shovel and we dug a little hole for Igor and we had a celebration of life service for him and we buried him into the earth. And then we all went away and we sang happily evermore that Igor is now in heaven. Now, as four-year-olds would want to be, I got very curious about that. And, and so I went out in about two weeks later because I wanted to know, did he really go to heaven or not? But when I dug him up, I was dismayed to find out that only his eyes had gone to heaven. And so I took Igor in my hands and I stomped into the house and mothers, you need to hear this so you can be prepared to answer your children when they ask you questions like this. I thrust this dead iguana up in the face of my mother and said, how come only his eyes went to heaven? You see, as a four-year-old, I knew about God. I knew about Jesus. I knew about life. I knew about death. And I knew about eternal life. What I didn't know about is that we get new bodies in heaven, so these bodies are decaying, and we get new bodies in heaven. So that's something that's very exciting for me, and I pray that that's exciting for you. But you need to hear that heaven is real. You need to hear that hell is real. And you need to hear why it's important that we settle in our own hearts and our own minds about the afterlife. Because what we believe about the afterlife affects everything we think, believe, and do today. Someday soon, we will stand before Jesus and Jesus tells us himself, he says one of two things. He's either gonna say to us, well done. You need to hear that, well done good and faithful servant, come on in. But the passage that strikes fear in the hearts of people is these, but he said there's going to be some people who cry out to him, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, talk to the hand because the face ain't listening. Get away from me because I never knew you. You can't fake Jesus. <laughs> you, you can't fake faith. You cannot fake Christianity. You either fully buy in and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the important thing is to know that when you do, that you are being transformed, that you no longer live for this world, but you live for the world to come.
We will become more like the Apostle Paul that, that says, you know what, it's better for me to be here with you, but I would actually rather die. Because to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. He endured imprisonment, beatings, and whippings, and torture, and we actually believe that he was beheaded because of his faith. And he endured it all because he wanted to share the love of Jesus Christ with as many people. And you and I are still hearing that message today because the message of the kingdom lives on. This Bible is called the living word of God. But we need to become more like the apostle Paul who said, for me to live is Christ. Meaning everything that I do with every breath that I have, I'm going to live for Jesus here on earth. But to die is gain. <laughs> Do you hear that? We don't have to be afraid of anything. Not sharks, not getting out of bed, not even the dreaded champagne cork. We don't have to believe or, or worry about any of those things because we are not afraid to die. But it also changes the way that we live. And one day, when Jesus asks us the question, and you need to hear it. It's not well believed. Because some people just say it's just as simple as just, just believe. That's all you have to do. Just believe. He didn't say well believed. He says well done. In Christianity, there's an action point. It transforms and changes the way that we think and the way that we live. You need to hear this. There's going to be two judgments. The first judgment is either you're in or you're out. And Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, or get away from me, I never knew you. You're either going to be granted entrance into heaven, or you're going to be sent immediately to hell, where you will live in one of those two places forevermore. But there's a second judgment that talks about being judged. And the Greek term for this is the bema seed of God, that he is the judge. Because we've already been judged about whether we're in or out. We're already there. But we're going to be judged for the things that we have done in the body. And in fact, in Scripture, in, in James, it, it tells us that faith without works is dead. Now, we don't work our way into heaven. It's grace. It is a gift of Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God that it doesn't depend on us or how good we are, but upon him and how good he is and what he has done for us. But when we really get it, I know some of you, some of you watching have never been to church in your life. Maybe this is the first time you've been to church. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. As people get annoyed with me when I say, yeah, if you're a Christian, you have to be in church somewhere. It's not a building. The church is the people. It's not a building. It's not the steeple. You open the doors. It's all the people. But when you understand the gift of Jesus Christ, then you are overjoyed with his grace and with his love, and you want to gather together. You want to hear the scriptures. You have a hunger to learn, to grow, to know more. But we're even learning in these days that the church is not here in the building. In fact, many churches put it in this, you know, you're going out into the mission field. When you leave the building, you're going out into the world because that's what Jesus did. He sent us out in the world to make a difference in the world. So, they say there's going to be two surprises when we get to heaven, assuming you get to heaven. I'm going to be there, not because I'm a preacher. In fact, they say it's harder for preachers to get in. I'm only going to be there because of the grace of Jesus Christ. But they say there's going to be surprise and, and who is there? And you're like, hey, some of you, I, I've, I've heard from Dave Pleatinks. Um, he's saying that a lot of our choir, many of them who are older, have never had a computer. They're getting computers. They're Zooming now and they're seeing their friends and they're, they're waving through the computer and they're going to see them. And there's this joy that comes out through that. And when we see one another in heaven, there is going to be a gathering in heaven and we're going to see people that we know and people are going to know us. And we're going to say, I had no idea that you're going to be here, but man, I have missed you. I am so glad to see you again. The other surprise is to find out those who aren't there. 
But there's even a third surprise. Because you and I have no idea how we affect the people around us. I want to ask you a question. What are you doing with the gifts of God? What are you doing with grace? What are you doing with your salvation? What are you living for? Some of us are afraid to die because we're clutching onto the things. We finally got our good house. We finally got a job. We finally got a car. We finally got that vacation. We finally got that degree. We have all these things and we want to go to heaven, but we don't want to go now because we're so tied to this world. The apostle Paul, he said, man, that's all junk. I don't even care about all that stuff I thought was important. That's not important. The only thing important is eternity. I live for Christ to preach him and him crucified. But what are you doing? What are you doing with the resources? Do you know that you can't have another breath without God giving you another breath? You won't receive another dime unless God gives you that dime. You are living your life. But I think one of the coolest things, if you're shocked to see somebody and they come up to you and say, thank you. Thank you for demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. I would never have been here without him working through you. Thank you. When we give, we're giving to the building up of the kingdom of God. When we use our spiritual gifts, we're building up the kingdom of God. This is an incredible place. And we have an incredible staff. And we have incredible volunteers. What you can't see is we're in our fellowship hall. And it has now turned into the food pantry. It's like an AP. It's like a Publix. There's food everywhere because people just like you are giving to make sure that those who don't have enough to eat have the food that they need. We have to meet their physical needs before they can begin to ask the question about the spiritual needs. But when we give into the world, Jesus said it's as simple as giving a, a cup of cold water to one who's thirsty, caring for a little child. Some of you, God bless you, you've taught Sunday school for years. And those children and those youth who are being unruly that you weren't think were paying attention they're actually paying more attention than you think. And maybe, just maybe, somebody's going to be there because you shared with them the love of Jesus Christ. From the simple gift, and, and sometimes we think it's the big things. But it's the little things. The simple gift of a cup of cold water. The gift of a warm embrace. A handshake. A hug a tender smile, a phone call, something that we have done to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ for somebody in our world. So what do we do with it? Same thing I think is true by the time we, we finish every single sermon. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't have to live afraid. You don't have to be afraid of dying. You don't have to be afraid of anything. Because the gift of Jesus Christ is by grace through faith alone. That's it. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. We're going to pray with you in just a few moments. For those who are already in the faith, and if you and God agreed at the beginning of this, that you're afraid of dying, you're afraid of death, then you need to accept the peace of Christ. You need to take on the heart and the mind of Paul who said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Some years ago, there was a, a movie with Dustin Hoffman, and I think it was called Little Big Man. And he had a grandfather Indian, and he said, today is a good day to die. And that, that phrase stuck with me because at the time I was really young, and I didn't want to die. But should that not be the mantra for every single one of us who are in Christ? Hey, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Today is a great day to die because it doesn't get worse. We're not going to something that we're unsure of. We're going to an even better place. And then finally is to live every day as if it's your last. I was 
listening to another preacher this week, and he had been to a celebration of life service at a funeral home, and he was talking to uh, the funeral director as well as one of the businessmen that had come in, and uh, the fellow who had passed away, passed away suddenly. And the three of them were all talking that, wow, I bet he had no idea. And that life is not certain. It could be a shark attack. It could be a heart attack. It could be anything, a plane. It could be a champagne cork in the eye. It could be anything. Life is fragile. But the pastor said within that week, both of the other men that he'd had a conversation with had died unexpectedly. We don't know. <laughs> and honestly, it doesn't matter. We're not afraid to die. Every day should be a good day to die. But in the meantime, every day should be a day for us to live for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are called to use his gifts that he has entrusted to us with the building up of his kingdom. Should we tithe? That's a big church word for giving to the church, 10%. He said, absolutely, we should. The temptation is we, we don't feel like we have enough, that God hasn't provided enough. And, and so we want to hold on to it for ourselves. It's like, you know what? It's only money. Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. That's nothing. And so it's a, it's a spiritual teaching for us to put God first in our lives. Tithe, give, absolutely. Volunteer. Some people, uh, sometimes churches are called the frozen and chosen because they just want to sit and soak. They just want to just have somebody give them comforting words. They don't want to have to work. Or maybe you're older and you say, well, I worked at one point, but I don't have to uh, work anymore. Let the young people do that. I uh, heard an African pastor say, there's no such thing in retirement from the kingdom of God. If you're alive, he's got something for you to do. If you're not dead, you're not done, and you should be doing something. You might have to be creative, but find your gift and use it for the building up of God's kingdom. Join a class. Join a Bible study. Join a fellowship group. Teach a class. Love your neighbor. Should we do all these things? Absolutely. There's a saying that says, they don't know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. If we will live every day in the fullness of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the hope of heaven, then we will naturally do these kind things for our neighbors. Why do I believe in the afterlife? Because the resurrected Jesus said so. May we live every day without fear, confident in the hope of heaven and peace everlasting. Amen? Amen. Let me pray with us. Father, we thank you for this day and I thank you for my dear friends who have tuned in. And Lord, we feel a little bit of a separation because we can't physically be with one another, but I thank you for the technology. Sometimes it's used for evil, but sometimes you have taken it, you have redeemed it, you have used it for good. Because I, I, I even heard this to this day that more people heard the good news of Jesus Christ this Easter because of this virus and because of this technology, more pastors were in media than ever before. Maybe people are hungrier. They're uncertain. They're living life afraid. They're cowering. They're sheltering. They're staying. We should be wise. We should trust our scientists, but we should also not tempt God. But Lord, you've told us today that we don't have to be afraid of a death. Every one of us is going to die. The question is when, how, and where we're going to land. Where we're going to be for all of eternity. Father, each one of us prays with those who have never received you as Lord and Savior. When we say, Lord, I believe in you. I believe you died on that cross. And everything that I believe about you and about eternal life comes because I believe that you rose from the dead. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life, wash me clean of my sins, transform my heart and mind. Send the power of the Holy Spirit to live in my life now and forevermore that I might live with joy. 
to my friends who are rededicating themselves, who have admitted that uh, they've been afraid of dying, but maybe today is the day when they say, Lord, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm ready anytime you are. But Lord, this day I rededicate myself to you and to your service. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, that I would know what spiritual gifts you have given to me and that you have given me a responsibility from doing the simple little things to being kind to a stranger, giving a cup of water, maybe just a little bit of food, sustenance for a day, but more importantly, giving something that is eternal and that is the love of Jesus Christ to a neighbor, to a friend, to anyone we meet. And Lord, we just pray that as we use these gifts, Lord, that you will get the glory and that your kingdom will be built here on earth. We live in the already and the not yet. You have already conquered the grave and yet we still live into the fullness of your kingdom. And Father, we all long to be with you but I pray that you would give us each the heart of Paul and say every day that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We thank you for these and all things in Jesus Christ. Amen.